Geologic Immigrants in the Pacific Northwest. That is the title tonight. Here it is. Most of these words make sense to us, but, and this is a geology talk, but an immigrant story, I think I need to explain what I mean by that. So let's set the hook for the lecture right off the bat. Most of us, not all of us, but most of us in our family histories, we have an immigrant. If we go back far enough in our family history, we can find somebody who took a long journey uh, from someplace else and arrived here in North America, in particular in the United States of America, right? In my case, there was a guy named Nicholas Zentner. In 1864, he decided he was going to leave the little village of Elm, Switzerland, up in the Alps, and he was going to go to North America. And Nick Zentner got himself to Liverpool. He got on a big ship. He crossed the Atlantic Ocean. He landed in New York later in the spring of 1864. And Nicholas Zentner then somehow got himself inland to southern Wisconsin, foot or, or, or steamboat or train or combination, nobody really knows. But he landed in southern Wisconsin, and that's where I grew up. So more than a, a genera- more, more than a century of Zentners have been living in that area, New Glarus, Wisconsin. So that's my immigrant story. And I know that many of you have maybe a similar story going back to Europe, perhaps, and crossing the Atlantic Ocean, but not all of us. Some of us have a Pacific crossing in our family history, and we're coming from Japan or Australia or Thailand, something like that. Maybe some of us uh, didn't cross an ocean to get here, but that immigrant in your family history uh, moved north from South America or Central America or Mexico and crossed the border and got into the U.S. or Canada down. You get the idea. So that's what I mean by immigrant. I literally mean immigrant like people, like people far enough back in our family history. But tonight's lecture is talking about geologic immigrants in the Pacific Northwest. There are places in northern Washington, in the North Cascades, where you can enjoy a beautiful mountain scene, for sure, just like everybody else. But if you know some geology, you maybe just get a touch more about the beautiful aspect of that place, because you know that a portion of that ridge came from Asia, and a part of that river valley floor came from Europe, in Washington, or a mountain range, came from Mexico. I'm pointing to Mount Stewart right now through that wall. So that is the gimmick of the lecture tonight. And if I'm successful, I can share with you some specific places that I've learned about in the last few years that are for sure not native crust, not native bedrock. But I got to warn you, you're maybe not going to get all that you want tonight. I can comment specifically on the details and the evidence for why that piece of crust came from Asia or Mexico or Europe, but I'm not going to have the entire itinerary of that immigrant. What the path was, when they left home, how they got here, which ocean plate was carrying them, there's problems. We're not totally there. We maybe never will totally be there with some of the immigrant stories of this geology. I mean, take a good look at me. I'm 61 years old. I'm basically the age of plate tectonics. I mean that literally, like we we didn't know about plate tectonics until the early 1960s, and that's about when I was born. You really expect us to have this all figured out in 61 years? It's a young science. So if somebody can see this lecture 100 years from now and look back on us, they're going to be, you know, laughing their they're going, to be, they're going to be amused by how little we know. But right now, in 2023, this is what we think we know based on the field evidence for the geologic immigrants in the Pacific Northwest. That was the introduction, everybody. Okay, so let's start with this. Here's Bijou the cat. Let's start with this. And the first immigrant story involves Mount Stewart. I don't know, did you see it this morning? Did, were you in town? Like, it's overcast here. It's pretty cold, late March, but it was lit beautifully in that snowy range to the north of us. The Stewart Range was on display all, most of the day today. And it will be hopefully tomorrow as well if you're, if you're new to the area. Okay, well, let's, let's take this in stages or steps. We'll eventually get to the immigrant story. So 
Let's say you're hiking with somebody and they can't stop talking about geology and they say, you're hiking up by Stewart. And they go, well, did you know Mount, uh, Mount Stewart's made out of granite? Okay, no, I didn't know that. Did you know that that granite of Mount Stewart is between 96 and 91 million years old? No, I didn't know that either. You're hoping that they'll stop talking, but you know, you're just looking at their back, you know, they'll just talk, you can't even really hear them. So they'll just keep going. So we need this magma 96 to 91 million years ago to invade the crust. And we have evidence that the Mount Stewart batholith, which is a large collection of magma, uh, intruded pretty shallow levels of the crust. So therefore, I don't think it's outlandish to imagine that Mount Stewart magma to be shallow enough to feed a volcanic system, 96 to 91 million years ago. Okay. So is Mount Stewart that we can see today a volcano? No, because it's made out of this granite, this underground magma chamber rock. And even the very top of Mount Stewart, more than 9,000 feet elevation, is the granite, is the magma chamber. So that means we have, again, this is the next step in the discussion if that person is still talking at you. We need to somehow take this magma, solidify it, get it totally cold. We can do that by 91 million years ago. And then we need to somehow daylight this granite. We need to get it to the surface, not just to the surface, but to 9,000 feet above sea level. Well, it's tough to get a real answer from geologists on this, but I think a safe statement is that that granite of Mount Stewart didn't really become a mountain range made out of granite in, in broad daylight until less than 10 million years ago. It's a pretty young mountain range story. So that means we need to uplift this whole picture, chew away a bunch of this country rock, get rid of the volcano completely, and end up with some kind of a true mountain range made out of granite and the granite and the Stewart range uh, as a whole. I'm not talking about immigrants yet. I'm just talking about a local story. And I think that's the end of the discussion for most people. I'm trying to add one more part of the story. This granite is from Mexico. There's good evidence for that now. It's invisible evidence. It's paleomagnetic evidence. Not all geologists accept the paleomagnetic data. But this story happened in Mexico. And the journey from Mexico to Washington happened sometime between 85 and 55 million years ago. The trip, the journey, the immigrant journey, not across an ocean now, but from Mexico up to Washington. Maybe a new thought for you right now is that if you're aware that the Mount Stewart granite didn't become to the surface until less than 10 million years ago, the journey north was underground, was in the dark. I think if, if you have heard that Mount Stewart moved from Mexico to Washington, you imagine this, but there's no evidence for that. Okay, we can stop there. There's a couple new thoughts for you perhaps, but we're not gonna stop there. Because if we go back to the first part of our story, I've just established now that this magma is intruding bedrock in Mexico, but not, aren't we curious now what was the bedrock that was there in Mexico that the magma is intruding? Is there a story there? There is. I need to make some space for myself. I'm gonna draw the same picture now. But now I'm going to emphasize more of the bedrock that was in Mexico between 96 and 91 million years ago. You know what? Now I'm going to do this. I just, I don't want to bring the magma in yet. Now we're older than 96 million years ago. And I'm going to put a diagonal line. That's a thrust fault. And this bedrock that is above the thrust fault is 162 million years old. It's green waxy rock that weathers to a deep orange. It's called serpentinite. And this 162 Mexican bedrock 
is not just serpentinite, but if you really look carefully throughout this 162 million year old bedrock, the country rock that was invaded by the Mount Stewart magma, there's serpentinite, there's sheeted dikes, there's argillite, there's pillow basalts. It's an ophiolite suite. An ophiolite suite. This stuff is called the Ingalls ophiolite. And if you're a fan of geology, you know ophiolites form in an ocean. More specifically, an ophiolite forms in an ocean floor where the crust is spreading open, like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and we're making brand new crust. Oh. So this stuff was in Mexico when the magma invaded, but this stuff wasn't formed in Mexico. This ophiolite formed out in the Pacific somewhere and got added to Mexico. You see how involved this can get. I'm just talking about right over there, by the way. I'm just talking about the area between here and Leavenworth. There's three immigrant stories just between here and Leavenworth. Wiping my nose with a cloth to... If this is a thrust fault, that means old rock is placed on top of younger rock, and that is for sure true. Underneath the Ingalls Ophiolite, underneath this thrust fault called the Windy Pass Thrust, is younger rock called the Chewakam Schist. Is it almost worth writing out in this penmanship? Perhaps. The Chewakam Schist is kind of a beige and black striped schist, metamorphic rock, with these beautiful red jewels in them. These ruby looking jewels, garnets. And there were many generations of metamorphism to create that uh, Chewakam schist. But if we undo the metamorphisms and undo the deformations and we get back to the original story, of the Chewakam Schist, guess where we are? Bottom of the Pacific. Deep ocean mud on the Pacific Ocean floor from 120 million years ago. Am I losing you? I hope not. In Mexico, we have two oceanic immigrants that somehow got out of the ocean, got onto Mexico, got thrust into this old on top of young story, and then and only then, starting 96 million years ago, are we going to bring in our magma, which we started with. That's the kind of detail that you can get. And so when you drive up the Tianaway River Valley from here, you get into this ophiolite. If you swing around to Leavenworth and you drive up the Icicle Canyon, you get into the granite and you get into the Chewakam Schist, the Chatter Creek Campground. It's all right here with a very specific story. Are we crossing an ocean with those immigrants? No. We're bringing the ocean itself, invading some magma in Mexico, and then sending everybody north. And if you have doubts about the Mexico story, I guess you need to come on Friday night when we talk about the paleomagnetism in the Pacific Northwest. That's a whole nother can of worms. Okay, now... Maybe that's what you expected coming to this talk. You know that I like to use Mount Stewart a lot when teaching. How can you not? And I don't know if it's, if it's clear to you, and it wasn't clear to me until about a year ago, but you are sitting right in here in Ellensburg, Washington, in central Washington, and Mount Stewart is right here. And Mount Stewart is, is part of something called the CPC, the Coast Plutonic Complex. And it's a collection of igneous and metamorphic rocks, lots of thrust faults, just what we were talking about. I should still have that. Um, where'd it go? Here. This scene, if you can read it, is duplicated dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of times in the coast plutonic complex. Plutonic meaning Batholus, plutonic rocks, complex meaning metamorphic rocks that have been thrust on top of each other, all the way from Ellensburg, Washington to Skagway, Alaska, is this corridor of incredible stories, immigrant stories. 
And again, we've got three separate immigrant stories just north of town. You could see how we could go on and on and on talking about these immigrant stories. But we're not doing that. Maybe somebody dragged it to this lecture and you're like, how much more is this guy going to talk? An hour total. That's the plan. So I want to get away from Mexico now. Oh, I can't hold it. Many people who embrace the paleomagnetic evidence see that Mount Stewart came from Mexico, but see a bunch of this other stuff as well came from Mexico. But that's for Friday. Okay. Let's change our tune completely, not leaving the thought of the lecture about immigrants, but now let's look at a completely different set of evidence making a case for Southwest Pacific Islands crossing the Pacific, landing on our shores, and somehow getting inland. Okay? These are mostly notes to myself, also a chance for me to write this out so I don't misspell. Possibly you can read these things. I don't know much about microfossils, but we're leaving paleomagnetic evidence, which is invisible to most people, even in geology, and we're going to paleomag sorry, we're going to uh, microfossils, which is also invisible data for many people. You hold the rock, you can't see the fossils. You need to get the fossils under a microscope. But let's take the, the, uh, the paleontologist's word for it, that if you can find Yabina foraminifera, fusilinids, if you can find Tethian foraminifera fusilinids in your rocks, in your limestones, you can make a convincing case that those limestones formed down by the equator on the opposite side of the Pacific Ocean. South Pacific, the Indonesian area, and arrived here, and not just kissed our shores, but got into interior British Columbia. Now, let me just tell you right off the bat, I tried from, I've been teaching here for more than 30 years, and I know that the North Cascades are right over there, and I tried, I don't know, every year and a half, I'm like, this is the year, I'm gonna learn North Cascades geology. And I'd read about two papers and I would just give up and I'd wait another six months and I'd try again. It's too complicated. There's too much out of my league to really follow. And I had a lot of time a couple of years ago for obvious reasons and I involved many of you uh, through the computer. But the point is, I finally learned some things about the North Cascades by leaving the North Cascades. And I crossed the border into Canada. Not literally, I couldn't. But mentally, I did. And I went to the interior of British Columbia, mentally. And I went to the Cache Creek terrain. Grello. The Cache Creek terrain in interior British Columbia. And that Cache Creek exotic terrain, which is not just a little sliver of it down in the North Cascades, but it's a major piece of real estate, is loaded with microfossils that say, you're coming from the other side of the Pacific Ocean. And you're also changing latitude. You're going from the equator up to today's British Columbia. Now there's gonna be a payoff for us here more close to home, but let's do a little bit more with the Cache Creek. So this is a map of Washington, but I want you to ignore the map of Washington, please. Can you do that? Can you just ignore the white lines? And I want to just sketch out something very simply for you involving the Cache Creek terrain. So this is not a map of Washington. This is sea level. This is a boat in the ocean. This is the Southwest Pacific. And this is an oceanic plateau. Much bigger in scale than the Big Island of Hawaii. Much bigger in scale than any oceanic island you can think of. It's Larger in scope, it's got a flat top. It's not an island, it's, it's underwater. And draped over the top of this long ago oceanic plateau is a bunch of limestone. And some of you know that limestones form in warm, shallow seas. So we've got to be close to the equator, we need shallow water, and we need some uh, living conditions, some growing conditions for these guys. Now hold on. Look at these dates, 290 to 255. 
Those are in millions of years ago. What did the globe look like between 290 and 255 million years ago? The answer is, that was Pangaea time. That was when we had one continent and one ocean. I'll have some maps for you, some world maps in just a bit. So to say Southwest Pacific is almost misleading because we had a totally different global geography, but I hope you can play along with me that the Tethian fossils are coming from the Tethys Sea, which best way for me to describe it is the opposite side of the Pacific Ocean. And we need to cross a big pond to get this oceanic plateau and these exotic limestones to us. And one more time, we're getting inland. We're not just at the shore. We're going inland to central British Columbia. How are we going to do that? These are notes for myself, and you maybe can't even read them. Let me read it to you anyway. So here's the, if we're following with the immigrant theme, here is the origin of our immigrant. They're back home in their home country, whatever we want, between 290 and 255. Again, we're off the shore of Asia, essentially. The journey sometime, somehow happens between 255 and 230. And by the time we get to 230 million years ago, we're still in Pangaea time. We're out in the Pacific somewhere. We have evidence that our Cache Creek friend is hooking up out in the Pacific with Stachynia and Quinellia, which are two also very large exotic terrains. Quinellia is on this side, Stachynia is on this side. They're big boys. And so these three guys in interior British Columbia are hooking up in the ocean. And the field mappers who've been working with these three exotic terrains in a large sense in British Columbia have made that case that we have the timing of these guys getting together out in the water. Green bean with peanut butter thrown in the middle. Cache Creek being scraped into this boomerang. Somehow we're getting this Cache Creek limestone being sandwiched between the twins, these two exotic trains, I can't stop. I can't, I can't hold it from those references. We finally accrete all three of these major terrains to North America 170 million years ago. And that's the intermontane superterrain. So do we have evidence of immigrants? Yes. Mexico? No. Europe? Not yet. Not tonight. But Southwest Pacific. And that story holds. Let's put that on hold. Let's keep it going. Before I leave the Cache Creek, I got to go to the notes now. That's what these are. And I wanted to make sure that before we quit tonight, we had specific spots for you to visit here in the Pacific Northwest to go and see these, to get your hands right on these rocks. Now, I already told you where to go to find the Mexican rocks. Where can I go find those Southwest Pacific rocks. Well, I gave you one example so far, Cache Creek, but that's maybe too long of a drive. A couple of you have driven down from there, but that's too much. I'm just going to read this quickly to you. Up in British Columbia, we can go to Cache Creek to find the Asian microfossils. Bridge River terrain. Harrison Lake, we're still in British Columbia now. But are you like me? We're not even really sure of the geography up there. Unfortunately, I haven't spent enough time in British Columbia. So let's get down into the States. Let's go into Washington. Where can I go in Washington to find exotic terrains that have Tethian fossils and Yabina fossils? I can go to the San Juan Islands. I can take a ferry out to Friday Harbor. I can do a short drive from Friday Harbor to Lime Kiln Point with that beautiful lighthouse. And I can bang on some limestones that are in these strange looking blocks Right at the coastline, yeah, there's a couple of whales out there, but we're not, we're looking at the rocks, man. And those Yabina fossils are there. Those, those, those forams are there in those rocks. Where else can I go in Washington to find these tr trans-Pacific fossils? If you've been to Artist Point by Mount Baker, up by Bellingham, and if you take the Yellow Aster Butte Trail, and you go up by Yellow Aster, there's lots of stuff there, including the Bell Pass Melange, which has some Tethian fossils, which is part of this story. That connects to Shucks and Arm, which is also visible right there at Artist Point. I can also go to Northeastern Oregon. I'm still just talking about the stuff that came from the Southwest Pacific, man. 
And it's not in a major belt. I mean, here's our major belt, the Cache Creek. But now we're talking about, I don't know, what are we talking about? We're talking about little slivers, little pieces, little, little scraps of newspaper uh, that are all maybe part of the same newspaper at one point. I guess they were, if we think about that Mondo Oceanic Plateau with all this, this equatorial limestone on top of it. We wouldn't expect it to all be this nice, beautiful little birthday cake here now, right? There's been a lot of time that's gone by. So the tendency is to connect the dots between all of these little exposures of Tethian fossils. I'm not sure we can do it, but I need to follow through and give you a few more because I got the notes right here. It's a, it's a pink ink for Christ's sake. The Baker terrain in the Blue Mountains, Tethian fossils. Rattlesnake Creek terrain in the Klamaths, southwestern Oregon. Tethian fossils. Even the Sierra Nevada foothills, the Calaveras terrain, Tethian fossils. So the closest place I can get you to, I don't know, I guess, I guess, uh, I guess the San Juans, I guess that's it for a while. No, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on. The closest place I can get you within a two-hour drive of here to find an exotic terrain that's been closely correlated to other terrains that have these southwestern Pacific fossils. If we drive to Wenatchee, we get on 97A, we get to the little town of Eniat, we hang a left, we start heading up into the hills on the Eniat River Road, that's the Napequa Schist. And the Napequa Schist has been closely correlated with the Cache Creek terrain. Now, the Napequa Schist doesn't look like limestone. It's been metamorphosed. And I'm pausing for dramatic effect because I learned just last summer that much of the crystalline core exposed along the North Cascades Highway, the North Cross Highway, State Route 20, which is full of snow right now, that's the Skagit Nice. I'll show you some pictures. But if you talk to the experts at the Skagit Nice, they say if you go back far enough in time with the Skagit Nice, it was Napequa Schist. And if you go back earlier than Napequa Schist, it was limestones from the frickin' Southwest Pacific. So even the Skagit Nice, which is a major, beautiful mountain forming uh, rock unit, which has been studied very carefully by a number of geologists ultimately has the specific northward, the, the, the southwest Pacific story. Because if you're a traditional field geologist, I'm sorry to say it this way, some of our most traditional field geologists are traditional field geologists. They don't believe anything unless they can see it in their hand after they've broken open the rock hammer. It shouldn't be that way, but it's true. I've run into this <laughs> directly in the last couple of years. These are the details we have now. Is it totally satisfying to see the toll journey? No, but I warned you about that. But when we make these pilgrimages to these beautiful places, Lime Kiln Point, Mount Stewart, etc., as geologists, we can see more than just beauty. We can even see more than just a couple of little factoids about the bedrock that we're breaking open. We can see that journey. We can see the place of origin, the rough timing, and then arrival. And this is Mount Rainier, beautiful. It's not exotic, there's no immigrant story at all. Mount Rainier formed here. So I'm not saying every mountain has an uh, immigrant story. We need to go far enough back in our family history to get to these immigrants. I think the analogy does work. We're talking about this stuff over here today all this complicated material that came elsewhere. But again, if we are younger than 50 million years ago, there are no immigrant stories, at least in our part of this scene. Well, we were talking about uplift. We were talking about raising things and eroding things away at the top, like here in the Yakima River Canyon south of Ellensburg. That doesn't work. This is beautiful. This is a local story. These are lava flows that are 15, 16 million years old. So some of these geologic concepts apply, but that's not what we're talking about here tonight. We need to be old enough to get to the story. So 
Let's do it. This is our magic time window of accreting or adding this exotic far-traveled material. There we go. Do you see Mount Stewart slightly differently than you did before? I hope so. I hope so. And yes, if you look carefully up by Asgard Pass at the Mount Stewart granite, it's salt and pepper rock. And it's not just granite, there's a whole range of chemistries with those plutonic igneous rocks from dark gabbros all the way up to granites. We're not hung up on that though, we're just calling it granite. And yeah, I'm not exaggerating, am I? This beautiful Mount Stewart dominates our northern skyline. And I can now see that this is the southern tip of this immigrant story that stretches all the way to Skagway, Alaska. Remarkable, I just didn't have that before. Kleelum in the foreground, I-90 in the foreground, a Mexican mountain range in the background. Now up on Long's Pass, on our side of the crest of Stewart, my wife and son are not in granite, they are in serpentinite. That's the Ingalls Ophiolite. That's the stuff that came up from Mexico as well. But remember now, the Ophiolite has an older story yet where we're out in the middle of an ocean somewhere in the Pacific with a spreading center. And here's what that rock looks like. Well, everything in the foreground is the 162 million year old Ingalls Ophiolite. Everything in the background is the granite, the salt and pepper granite. Everything's from Mexico, but the Ingalls has an older, longer ocean story. And yeah, you break open some of that Ingalls and you can see that true green waxy rock. Many of you know that if you've been up the Tianway. And in the creeks, these beautiful weathered orange and bright red serpentinite. Mexico, Stewart, Ellensburg, Washington. Now, backcountry Gary, uh, who has made a lot of beautiful photos over the years and has donated them to the geology teaching here, gets us on the north side of the Stewarts. And so now we can see not only the Ingalls and the Stewart, but there's that stripy rock with the beautiful red jewels within it, the Chewakum. So they're all three right here. Remember the beginning of this lecture? They're all right here, north of Ellensburg. And those relationships with the Windy Pass thrust and the Windy Pass thrust apparently was only active between 100 and 96 million years ago. There's a reason for that short burst of thrust fault action, which we'll get to in a couple, actually tomorrow night. So thank you, Gary Paul, who is native. He grew up in Washington. Glacier Peak, Mount Baker, Stratovolcanoes, they grew up in Washington. The only thing that didn't grow up in Washington, this stuff here. The Chihuacan schist from Mexico and earlier on the floor of the Pacific Ocean. You can see the beige and black stripes. Oh, come on, Gary. My favorite photo. But looking at the Chihuacum here, are these big, beautiful garnets. And I'm not much of a collector, but I'm happy to say, if you go to the Chihuacum schist up Icicle Creek and you go far enough up that canyon, even somebody like me can find them. They're not that hard to find. Beautiful garnets in the Chihuacum schist. Mexican garnets. As we continue to enjoy these beautiful photos from Gary Paul, I want you to notice that every once in a while, something familiar will, will pop up. There's the Chihuacan schist, yes. So not everything in our mountain pictures have the same immigrant story, but if we train our eyes and we know the key units, we can see those stories. I can just say it differently, can't I? Ophiolite, 162 million years ago from the ocean floor. Ophiolite, 162 million years ago from the ocean floor. And there's story after story after story like that in the North Cascades of Washington. As I indicated, it's just the start. If we cross the border in British Columbia, we continue those stories up through Harrison Lake and the Coast Mountains. We continue that story up by Bella Coola, Prince Rupert. We continue that story all the way up to Skagway, Alaska. There are dates that are not stressed tonight, but the two major accretion dates are 170 and 100 million years ago for much of this material. And if I didn't, I don't think I did say it, so let me say it now. So our Mexico story did not cross an ocean, and that journey, I did say this, 
uh, between 85 and 55 million years ago. Our Southwest Pacific stuff is arriving roughly 170 million years ago. And our European stuff, which was the oldest exotic terrain material, the gneisses and the, and the other sedimentary rocks, they had created along with Rangelia 100 million years ago. So I'm emphasizing that the age of the rocks that are in the immigrant story are not exactly the same as the age of when we add them. Cash Creek sandwiched between Stachinia and Quinellia. Remember now, the Napiqua schist is tied to the Cash Creek story. Not a limestone, but it's been through hell. The Napiqua schist, lower left-hand corner, off to the right. Lots of history there, lots of metamorphisms, but I'm talking about the early days of that material. What did it look like and where did it come from? Answer, Southwest Pacific. Isn't that crazy? This is about the opposite place you would think of as the Southwest Pacific. But that's the power of plate tectonics. Okay, I can drive this one, I think. And all I want to show you is that this is Pangaea. And I want you to notice right in here, this is the Tethys Sea. And I hope you can see that this is open ocean all the way around until we get to this is Western North America. So I'm truly saying that during this time, we are getting stuff that has Tethian fossils from here, off to the right, bring it in from the left, and then add it 170 million years ago. All the while, we're breaking apart this supercontinent known as Pangaea. This is me controlling the screen here. I hope it don't make, make you sick. That wouldn't be good. Tethian fossils, Napiqua schist. Tethian fossils, Napiqua schist. I think you get the point right now, but we can enjoy these photos, can't we? Skagit Nice in the backcountry of the North Cascades. If we go back far enough in time, Napiqua schist, if we go back earlier than that, you've heard it now, Cache Creek. Oh, really? Are there Tethian fossils done in the Skagit Nice? Of course not. We've, we've, th this rock has been metamorphosed so many times, it's been plunged deep, it's been brought back to the surface. But there's other ways to correlate these very complicated metamorphic rocks to their original protolith. All right, Gary, I can't stop, but we get the point. Even above North Bend, Washington, the West Melange Belt, there's enough Tethian fossils, scraps of it, to tie to this Southwest Pacific story. Makes you look at this place different, doesn't it? Switching gears finally to our European story, the Chilliwack Group and the Yellow Aster Nice is up at the U.S.-Canada borders. Tommy Hoy Peak, this is up again near Mount Baker and Bellingham. It's mostly these two guys here just south of the border that came from where? Northern Europe. These are the Zircons now. So to help you see this, Marty, let's try to do it this way. This is North America 400 million years ago. Do you see how much of a mind stretch we need to go here? We can't use any present day geography, but we have good evidence that these continents were placed in this place at this time 400 million years ago. And here's the old equator at this time. This is before Pangaea. So this says Laurentia, but that means North America. This says Baltica, but that means Northern Europe. And we're gonna somehow get pieces of Wales and Scotland away from Baltica and send them through the Arctic, even though the Arctic at this time, 400 million years ago, was south of 30 degrees north. Is this making sense to you? Not the Arctic today, but the Arctic back then. We're saying Arctic because we're between Siberia and North America. Well, here it is. This is the Alexander. This is, the, this is our chunk, but there's other chunks as well that did this swimming through. So let's do it with some other maps from Joanne Nelson. Here's the time. Here's our Northern European scraps. And they're leaving Northern Europe and they're somehow gonna get 
all the way around the horn. Alaska doesn't exist at this time, by the way. All the way around the horn, and we're somehow going to have them land in, in the Pacific Northwest. You want to do it? Let's do it. Doink. 395 million years ago. We're following these yellow Alexander terrains through the old Arctic corridor and throwing the Yukon Tannin on a few others as well. But let's freeze it right here. 290, so we're mostly to Pangaea time now. I know this is mind blowing if you haven't heard this before. Now we have, let's just slow down for a second. Here's the Northern European stuff, Alexander, that by 290 million years ago has connected to Rangelia, which is a famous exotic terrain. This is the European stuff. But look at what's also out here in the water next door. Here's our Body Cache Creek, which is in between Stikinia and Quinellia. And so this is the Southwest Pacific. So we have lined up, docked, not docked yet, but out there in the water, European stuff and Southwest Pacific stuff all poised to slam on and add acreage to us, but it's not happening yet. This is the kind of detail that's been put together, but of course these maps look different depending on which geologist you are reading. This is Joanne Nelson. And sure, by 250, we're starting to add some stuff. By 190, we get the green bean being folded and we're shoving some Cache Creek in there. And we end up with the yellow Astra Butte from Northern Europe, ensconced in all the rest of this stuff that came from these different locations. You can look at maps for a while, but you need photos like this to bring it all home. A trail up at the Yellow Astra Butte area. Thrust fall, this is our Northern European gneiss. The Yellow Astra gneiss, part of the Chilliwack terrain. Look at how complicated this rock looks. A geologist next to a big block of Bell Pass Melange. Whoops, now we're talking about Tethian fossil scraps and Southwest Pacific. Also in the Yellow Astra area. So if, if you want a, one place that has its bang for its buck, for two of the three exotic terrain immigrant stories tonight, that's the place to go. The Yellow Astra Butte Trail near Artist Point between uh, Mount Baker and Mount Shuxon. Yellow Aster, Felsic Nice. The San Juans, just general story that about everything that you'd want is there as well. So if you want another bang for your buck spot, I would go to the San Juan Islands because so much has been Thinly, thinly sliced and stacked to make up these incredible San Juan Islands, Deception Pass and everything else. I've chosen not to get into the details tonight, but these are the pizza boxes that have been stacked one on top of another, and these hats have been separated from their heads. Just to give you a sense at Rosario Head of the incredible deep ocean stories that are now at San Juan Islands. 170 and 110, not the major emphasis tonight, but included in this lecture. And this is more just an animation to play, uh, to give you a sense that the purple is already the material from the Southwest Pacific that's accreted. The orange is, is in part our, our European material. And we will look at this again in the other lectures this spring uh, to see what's going on and to tease out all these details within this animation. Just wanted to give you a sense of all this stuff going on with the immigrants that have arrived. Once they get to us, that's not the end of the journey. And plotting the position of North America compared to plotting the location of this material coming in, that also has been carefully worked out by other means, which we will again explore in the next few lectures this spring. Thanks to these three geologists who inspired me to learn about the North Cascades because they asked me to be part of their research team and to be their public outreach person. So I needed to learn what they were doing. And I learned a, a bunch directly from them and then also uh, uh, related to their work. 
And I've been working with them in the field every summer in the North Cascades, and it has been a very rewarding experience. And a thanks to many of you watching this lecture as well, because you were learning these things with me. And in a way, this lecture is just one way to boil down all those details that we were able to learn in the backyard during the global pandemic. Thanks, everybody, for coming tonight. I do appreciate it. Thank you.